Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Noah Greenhill, the former Senior General Manager Marketing and Business Development of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the person involved in the establishment of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange's alternative exchange, better known as the Altex, a market for small to medium-sized companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which is Africa's biggest stock exchange. Noah, it's great to chat to you. South Africa is in desperate need of growing the junior end of its mining market. What, in your view, should be done to ensure investor support for junior miners that are aspiring to list their companies? Martin, it's a complex response to a simple question. So part of the challenge is the perception uh, that it's all around the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that they need to make the the requirements for listing your business on the exchange, especially a junior or exploration uh, type company, that they need to cater in the rules for those types of companies. Exchanges around the world have got the same problem, trying to find the equilibrium point between regulations that give investors confidence and not enough regulation that uh, anybody and everybody who kind of says, I've got a, I've got a hole in the ground, uh, we've drilled one hole and uh, there be gold. Um, so so th- that's a challenge for exchanges around the world. I don't think that's the problem. I, I do think that uh, the pendulum swings all the time between those two points not necessarily lands it at equilibrium every time, but exchanges around the world kind of vacillate between too much or too little regulation. And and I suppose that the follow-on from that is that who's the, the regulation for? Is it the company? In other words, as I've just alluded to, is it to keep the company out or in either way? Or is it to appease the money? So so that's the first element of it, is is the exchange created an environment to attract companies to list? Uh, I I think the exchange is fine, certainly from a Johannesburg Stock Exchange point of view. My view is that the requirements are in line with the rest of the world, probably marginally better from a governance and compliance perspective, uh, the fact that you have to be code compliant, the fact that we're, we've we created rules to attract uh, dual listed companies, all fantastic, lovely. Uh, is it any better or worse than our competition? And I use that in inverted commas, being the, the TSX in Canada, uh, London, Hong Kong, Australia, or in actual fact, any other exchange around the world, I think we, we're we're in good company. We can we can hold our heads high from a governance and and compliance perspective. Um, and and let me just say my last point on on governance and compliance. Crooks will always be crooks. You can have uh, volumes of rules. The crooks will find ways around those rules. Um, so, you you know, it's just w- one of those conundrums that we're never going to solve. No matter how many rules we got, somebody's going to find a way to contravene those rules. So the next challenge becomes when a junior mining or exploration company walks the streets in South Africa uh, to raise money for their operation or their listing, it is a debilitating, uh, demeaning, and and often you know, soul-destroying exercise. You know you've got a good uh, project. You know you've drilled the holes. You know the detail in the documents is solid uh, and complies with all the rules and regulations. Your geologists are world-class. Your your mining engineers are world-class. You've got the best of the best, and you walk around. And if you can get an appointment... The appointment lasts 20 minutes because at the end of it, nine out of 10 times, mm, no thanks, we don't uh, invest in the junior and exploration sector in South Africa. 
Sure. Okay. So now what? The, the money will only look at you when you're developing, developed, when you have an operational mind. But then why is it different in Bay Street in Canada, in Toronto? How can it be that different that the funds there get it? First of all, they're prepared to see you because they understand that when they see 10 and they're prepared to invest in 10, one is going to fail miserably. Two are going to be downright average. Six are going to border on maybe just below average or, or under average. But that leaves one. That's all they need. One. And one to invest at a valuation of 100 that becomes 1,000 makes the other nine pale into insignificance from a portfolio perspective. And they get it. So the other argument that, that I've heard is, but the valuations are better offshore. So same document, because the document must be the same. So the the pre-listing statement that states uh, your drilling results, that states your uh, prospective uh, income over time, it's the same document. Yet the offshore fund manager looks at it and says, I'm prepared to put a whatever valuation on this, 100. The South African uh, fund looks at it and says, not worth 20. How can that be? How can there be such a dichotomy in this valuation? And, and I, I can't work it out. Uh, I do think that there's a fair factor in the South African fund market. And, and, and I think it is a function of history. And, and, I've, and I've said this for years and years and years, and I just don't think that the, the cycle has, has ever been broken. And, and that is that we were a, a market dominated by the large mining houses. We didn't have to think as money in South Africa about exploration or junior mining. We allowed the large uh, mining houses to have to worry about that. We gave them our money. They then went and explored. We didn't have to worry. And, and we never focused on exploration. We just thought it happened. And, uh, you, you know, if we benefited from it through an Anglos or, or the, the JCIs of, of yesteryear, um, we didn't have to worry. And I think that's just pervaded over time that it just happened somewhere and somebody else takes care of it. And when it's a operational mine, we'll sit up and invest in this operation. But until then, somebody else's problem. Whereas Canadians specifically, I suppose you could include the, the Australians in the mix, they get it. They want to be in on the ground floor. Notwithstanding value destructing operations like the BRIEC scandal, th their memories are short term. We've got long memories. We remember them from 25, 30 years ago. And, it, and because it happened in our jurisdiction, it's going to happen again. And that's just the way it is. Now, I, I mean, I, I, and, and I'm loathe to bring in the, the current environment from a political, economic perspective. You, you know, maybe they're right. Uh, you, you know, we've taken a country that uh, had infrastructure, had constant electricity, had solid water, had, had roads, had medical health care. And, and we've destroyed it. So maybe there's an element of an inability to take what's in the ground and develop it. But in saying that, and I'm contradicting my, myself, in saying that, we're in the top five in terms of minerals in the world, in terms of what's underground and what can be done with it. So, so that's not a function of any of the infrastructure that I've just spoken about. People are prepared to come into South Africa and drill. Must be, because the stuff's there. And if that's the case, they need the funding. 
how come the Canadian guy is prepared to fund it? How come? I, and, and there, I don't necessarily have the, the answer. But why was uh, Canada successful? Well, the flow-through shares beginning in the, in the early 1970s, uh, the Canadian government said, sure, guys, we're, we're losing ground in um, exploration investment. We don't seem to be attracting any of that cash. Let's introduce something that attracts money to the sector. And they sat around the table and some really clever tax guys came up with this uh, flow through shares concept and off they went. And the rest, as they say, is history because they attracted an inordinate amount of money. And not only attracted the money, but in attracting the money, promoted the sector in the, in the jurisdiction, created jobs, provided tax, uh, not just from an employee perspective, but from a corporate perspective. And they got it. And they understood it. And it's developed since then. And I remember, again, going back a good few years, that flow-through shares was a, was a real tag used by companies to promote their, their operations, notwithstanding the fact that the flow-through the flow share benefit only applied to exploration in Canada. But yet, around the world, people would go, oh, well, there's a flow-through share opportunity. We, we've got to be involved in it. And, and so, interesting that it was used as a sales tool to attract cash to Canada from around the world. Our tax authorities, and I was involved in, a, in an initiative to the SARS uh, and Treasury to try and promote junior and exploration mining in South Africa. And our tax authorities were of the view that we've got to do something, fine. We can't do fl a flow through shares type initiative because... Uh, we just we don't want to change our legislation too drastically, and um, they introduced the 12J uh, tax reform uh, that was supposedly written on the back of junior mining, but was then bastardized and uh, abused um, for a whole host of other sectors, and subsequently closed down. Um, but tax incentives work. We, there's clear evidence of it in Canada. Clear evidence. The same thing with, with AIM in the UK that introduced a capital gains rollover incentive for uh, investors investing in AIM attracted money to that market. We've done nothing. Again, we talk. We should, we could, we need to. We, what can we? No, we don't want to do that. We're, we're South Africa, we're different. We need to be uh, uniquely African and uniquely South African. Okay, well, if we adopt that, kind of, uh, adopt that kind of an attitude, we are where we are. We've got, uh, what is it, 39 mining companies listed. It's, it's, it's a travesty. It's insane. That we're in the mining mecca of the world and we're not the representative uh, jurisdiction for mining investment. How can that be? And then we, we have that added challenge in that the Canadians, the Australians, the Chinese, the English, uh, every other jurisdiction in the world is happy to invest in those operations in South Africa because, well, where else are you going to get platinum from? Where else are you going to get chrome from? Where else are you going to get anything from if part of your portfolio is not invested in operations in South Africa? The next point is, and I remember the days where we had the infrastructure, we had rail, we had roads, we had power, 
And often the, the argument was put forward that, sure, why would you want to be in a, in a jurisdiction where, sure, to get your, your drill to the actual operation is a five, six-month uh, operation. We didn't have to worry about that kind of thing. To get your drill to your operation in South Africa, you put it on the back of a truck or put it on the back of a train back then, and and the drill was uh, was there in a flash. Um, that that I think has created some challenges for us. And again, I come back to the money. All we do is create ex more excuses not to invest here, whether it's the MPRDA, whether it's uh, uh, infrastructure, rail, power, uh, healthcare. Uh, uh, migrant workers, uh, the list is long. All we do is create excuses not to invest. We need to change that narrative. We need the Minerals Council. We need uh, minerals uh, and resources uh, government to stand up and understand that we're in a com competitive game, that at the end of the day, uh, money doesn't have to come to South Africa. Money can go where it chooses. It's free to go where it chooses, and it does. So we tried to reinvent the wheel. We tried all sorts of things to stimulate mining. Isn't it better to just see what is working now? It's, it's working in other places and stop trying to reinvent things until we really get things going. Maybe we can do that later. So I, I think there are a couple of, of challenges. Um, I think we have to appreciate that this is a five-day game. Now, it's a five-day game that we should have started five days ago. We can't sit on our hands waiting for somebody to do something. We need to do something, whether it's flow-through shares, whether it's a, a tax deduction on an investment in a mining company listed on an exchange so that there's a, a mechanism to prove that you've made it and it's not just some private investment, but but that's all technical uh, um, stuff that needs to be work, worked out by the experts. But do something. The, the second point is, and again, one of the unintended consequences of the flow through shares was that it created a retail investment community in the Canadian market. Now, you, you know, there are millions of people in Canada that invest in the stock market. There are millions of people that invest in junior mining and exploration companies in Canada. Part of the challenge in South Africa is we don't have a big enough retail investment community. What does that mean? It means we're reliant on the funds. What does that mean? Every time a company goes to the fund, maybe there's a mandate issue. Maybe uh, for some or other reason, the pension fund has said, sorry, uh, junior mining and exploration is too risky. We're not investing. Finished. So that's that fund out the gate. In Canada, I don't actually have to go to the funds. I can set up with a stockbroker, bring your clients, and let me talk to them. And if if uh, there's a thousand clients there and and a hundred of those invest a thousand dollars, sure, we're already a long way on our way to uh, um, raising some decent capital. South Africa, limited uh, retail component, um, and and that needs to change. And the way, in my view, you've got to change that. Again, examples around the world, whether it's Australia, whether it's Canada, whether it's the UK, whether it's America, um, tax incentives. Using the tax infrastructure to make it beneficial to invest. But the fact is, public markets have been around for years and years and years and years and years. Fact is, they work. Fact is, we're... Contrary to global trends in terms of, of uh, listings and capital raise, why? It's not right. Um, again, we should be the bastion and the light 
for the African continent. And I think we were for a while. And we, we just seem to, to be moving in the wrong direction. And, and I, I do think that there are really creative ways of changing the, the, the direction we're going in. But, but let, let me just end with saying um, the retail investor is critical to the success. And if we have an incentive, we found that in Canada, it started people getting interested in putting some money into, and at the same time, it built the retail investor. So will that incentive kill two birds with one stone before we start worrying about anything else? Uh, can't we start with that? Yeah, so so that's exactly it. Um, I, I think the intended or unintended consequences of growing the retail investment community in South Africa, and I think there are uh, like uh, organisations like Easy Equities, um, but but again, it's the chicken and egg. So part of the challenge is nobody's prepared to come to market to challenge the the view that there's no money. And those that do come to market are so scared that, uh, you you know, you don't want a failed listing, so you want to go to the safe money um, and you end up uh, not going to the retail market. But again, I say to you, it's a five-day game. We've got to keep at it. And and I think part of the problem is, certainly in the, in the 2000s, we, we, had a, we had a bit of it. And then guys were just being batted away with a with a baseball bat and it hurts and eventually you you stop eventually you go guys you, you know and whether it's the corporate advisors whether it's the management teams whether it's the funders who are going well you, you know we've seen five we've told all five to go away same with the 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 management teams well we've been to five we got battered it's enough let's go to where you can raise money, and that's not you. So to close off, what would you recommend? What, in your view, should be the biggest takeaway from this interview? We have the resources. We're already 10 steps ahead, because if you need those resources, you got to come to South Africa. Let's make it conducive for all concerned to play in the game. That means... The rules and regulations, whether it's listing, raising a VC, private equity, debt, whatever it is, are attractive across the board for those guys to come and, and raise the capital here. Let's make it attractive for the money to invest. And whether that's a tax incentive, whether it's uh, some other kind of incentive, we need to start the game, to your point. We can't be talking about it. Somebody needs to do something with the acceptance that it's not going to happen in a day. We've got to be on the field, at the wicket, and for a while we're going to be blocking. We're not, going to, we're not even going to hit the, the loose balls. We're just going to let the loose balls go. We're just going to block for a while. And when we got some runs on the board, well, then we can start hitting uh, some fours and sixes. But let's get some runs on the board. And I kind of feel like, sure, we've sent in 11 batsmen and 11 batsmen are out. Okay, let's start the game again. That was Crew Media's Mining Weekly speaking to Noah Greenhill about the steps South Africa should take to grow the junior end of the South African mining business. <laughs>